Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, welcome everyone to today's Market Links webinar. And as Jenny said, this session will be recorded and it will be shared on the Market Links website along with the slides um, following uh, today's session. Uh, so on behalf of Market Links, I'd like to actually hand it over to Laura Meissner, Senior Economic Recovery and Markets Advisor for USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for opening remarks. Laura, over to you. Thanks so much, Julie. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. Um, we are delighted to all be here for what we hope is going to be a rich conversation and exchange of um, With COP27, of course, ending just a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure that the threat of climate change and the need to work towards our shared vision of a resilient, prosperous, and zero greenhouse gases is on everyone's mind. We know that on the one hand, high emission economic development and environmentally unsustainable economic development contribute. On the other hand, when we can have that is rooted in sustainability, sound management of natural resources, and equity and inclusion, is Laura. transformative. Laura, my apologies. Um, you seem to be cutting in and out uh, with your audio. Um, and I'm not sure if maybe you can be closer, but we're having some difficulties um, with the audio. Um, give me one moment. That work when you can, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It just comes in and out. Maybe just being closer to your microphone on your laptop or computer. It's oh, a little no. bit better. Um, I'm not sure what's happening. It seems to come in and out. Okay. Does, does this work? Um, I can hear you for, for now. Yeah. Why don't okay. you go ahead and try? Okay. Thanks. Fingers crossed. <laughs> and if you have a if you have a headset that you can put on, that might help as well. Um, my headset unfortunately this morning shows. So, <laughs> what can you do? Um, but. Just getting back to things. So we know that, of course, that this year has been a record high for humanitarian needs. There were 274 million people estimated this year worldwide in need of humanitarian assistance and protection and an estimated 41 billion dollars globally needed for response, according to UN's office for the coordination of humanitarian affairs. And of course, although it's rooted in a desire to save lives and alleviate suffering. The large amount of waste generated by humanitarian action itself can also undermine communities desire for resilience and healthy growth. So, for these reasons, we are really pleased as USAID's Bureau for humanitarian assistance to convene today's webinar with Chemonics international. To share initiatives from both the development and the humanitarian perspectives around finding inclusive market based solutions across different value chains. Adapting processes and production. Reducing waste, improving recycling and reuse, and responsible waste management. We really hope that you, the Market Links community, will be open with sharing your questions, your ideas, your own successes, and your own challenges. We are all very much on this learning journey together. I'd now like to introduce our speakers, Elise Bell and Dr. Abdelatif Al Shafia. Ms. Bell is a contractor program specialist with the supply chain management division at USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. She focuses on procurement and transportation for emergency response, as well as on environmental sustainability and end of life waste management. Dr. El Shafia is the recycling enabling environment lead for the USAID Recycling and Jordan Activity. He has a wealth of experience in socioeconomic development. Establishing sustainable, hygienic, and environmentally sound infrastructure, integration of local communities, humanitarian aid and inclusion of refugees, equality and empowerment of women and girls, public service delivery, and good governance. I'd now like to hand things over to our moderator for today, Liz Keller, a senior specialist on global economic growth and trade practice team at Commonics, where she facilitates cross project learning and connections supports business development and economic growth programming, and engages with the wider development industry. Over to you, Liz. 
Thank you so much, Laura, for that wonderful introduction and really setting the scene for today's discussion. Uh, during today's session, we'll have presentations from both speakers, we'll have a moderated panel, and then we'll open the floor for a Q&A. As Laura mentioned, uh, we do encourage you to post questions or comments in the chat during the presentations or panel, and we will have a quick poll, uh, I think, starting up here in a minute um, as well for you all. So we'll begin with a presentation from Elise Bell on the BHA supply chain's overall work in climate change, the multilateral joint initiative, and lessons learned for facilitating circular economy approaches in humanitarian assistance. Over to you, Elise. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Liz. So I think now I take over the slides. We've just launched the poll. So if you'll just, everyone will just take a moment. If the poll didn't automatically open up for you, you'll notice in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there's a small button with three dots in it. And if you click on that, that will open up the poll. And we'd love to know what challenges have you experienced in integrating recycling or circular economy principles into your operations? And there's four choices for you. Our fourth choice, if you have another uh, response you'd like to put, you can just go ahead and put that into the chat for us. So we'll just give you a moment to complete that. Be sure to click submit. We'll be closing the poll in just about 10 seconds or so. Okay, we're going to close the poll. Thank you, Jenny. And I think the results will be coming up soon and we can maybe take a look at those in between our presentations or before the Q&A. Well, we have to show them now and then we'll be able to close them and move the, you back to the presentation. Perfect. Let's take a look now. Uh, five more seconds and it'll, it should appear. Here we go. All right. You're able to see the results now. Wonderful. And I think this is interesting. It looks like there's a bit of a smattering across. Uh, funding to manage seems to be uh, one of the biggest ones. And so these are some of the challenges our speakers are definitely going to be talking about today. So thank you, everyone. Over to you, Elise. Perfect. Thank you. And that poll, I always appreciate a good poll to get started. Um, I don't know if I have control over the slides. Oh, there we go. Um, so thank you for that. So my name is Elise Bell, and as you all heard, I'm with BHA as an institutional support contractor in the supply chain management division. So I might not have all the answers that you'd be looking for through such a presentation, but I'm honored and happy to represent more than a, do a dozen individuals from different teams and even organizations who advance these principles and efforts that I'm about to graze through. Um, so as a disclaimer, I might not be able to get down on the weeds, but I'm more than willing to serve as a connector of information and individuals. Um, because after all, connecting with one another is perhaps one of the most important things we can do if we're looking to implement more environmentally friendly programs and make meaningful changes. So sitting in BHA, we recognize that robust Concerted partnership is really non negotiable um, when we're thinking about turning all these environmental aspira aspirations into programmatic reality. Uh, so, this is why back in 2019, BHA and the World Food Program co established this joint initiative for sustainable humanitarian packaging waste management. Uh, don't say it too fast or too many times. It might be early or late in the day for some of you. So, I'm just going to hear on say joint initiative or even J.I. more colloquially. Um, there's publicly available fact sheets on this that we can certainly share with you, and I will get into kind of what the J.I. is now. So it's a collaboration of 20 
humanitarian partners working together to make packaging assistance more environmentally and socially responsible. Um, sounds specific that it's focused on packaging, but once I get into the activities, you'll see just the breadth and depth of which this group is covering. So the organizations or the membership is comprised of a range of donors, public international organizations, and private voluntary organizations. Sorry, I'm trying to click through the, yep. Um, so you'll notice that many are not involved here and we're definitely looking to expand involvement, cast a wider net to include even more locally focused partners. So if you're interested in learning more, or if your organization is inclined to even join in on this coordinating body, please feel free to reach out anytime. Would love to talk about kind of what membership entails, what type of meetings we have, all of that fun stuff. Um, representatives from each organization bring their own expertise, capacity, enthusiasm for, um, for these different efforts, and we can't work in silos. So the JI essentially is meant to bring together this range of perspectives as we recognize common goals and coordinate on complementary activities. So here's the aim and the approach. Uh, it's centered around circular economy thinking, shifting the narrative from waste to opportunities. We'll get into upcycling and some of that later. Um, but it's both kind of from the working level and from the highest upper echelons of an organization. And it's really just about raising awareness, swapping notes, seeing what we can do on this collaborative path forward. One of the things that I should note, all this talk about coordination, you all might be keen to better understand what's happening at the donor level. So we worked with DG Echo and the Swiss Development Cooperation to conduct this multi-donor policy landscape analysis, um, essentially with the aim of better coordinating. So understanding what requirements donors put forth now to see what can be mainstreamed, what can be further greened, um, for better sustainability and what can be standardized across the board. So this is, of course, as you can imagine, a pretty gargantuan task and much is to be done, but we've seen um, quite a few kind of policy and advocacy pieces come out that we can now really point to when we look to justify as if this work really needs justification, all of these environmentally focused efforts. Um, so we have our Bureau Environmental Officer, Erica Claseri on the line, who actually will be able to speak more to COP27 discussions, what's come through in the climate strategy and our special objective. Um, but I guess just one to call out here is the ICRC and IFRC Climate and Environment Charter for Humanitarian Organizations. This provides a framework for the humanitarian community something that we can use holistically to tackle humanitarian impacts linked to climate change and environmental degradation. Um, there's 325 or so signatories to date, which is super encouraging. Um, we'll also drop a link in the chat for you all later so you can see if your organization perhaps has already signed on. Um, so we have many hands on deck, um, but there's definitely a lot of ground to cover. So. JI activities focus on a range of different disciplinary areas, many of which are certainly interconnected, but some focus on policy advocacy. Others focus on baselining, capturing data and evidence so that we can actually have something to point to when we're looking to make changes in procurement. So one of those efforts has been, for instance, to do a massive stock taking exercise of all of the packaging units and associated empty weight of that that we put out into the world, trying to understand the cadence, the volume, the flow, um, just so we can begin to understand, you know, beyond, oh, we sent a lot of polypropylene bags. Well, how many was it? Recognizing that a lot is reused, um, what's left kind of to manage. We also focus on procurement, which I'll get into next. Um, and that goes into design, production, and distribution of the actual commodities themselves. And then we're also incorporating this end of life piece into our line of thinking in the sense that if we're really trying to 
do a no harm approach, we need to consider the post distribution discarded packaging or materials that don't end up having an obvious reuse or repurpose. So that gets me into um, just the rest of the presentation. In the spirit of true circularity, we're looking upstream and downstream for opportunities to green our operations. Circular economy move means we're moving from the traditional linear model of production, use, discard, to instead keep these resources in circulation and reduce our footprint. So first, I wanna briefly acknowledge the work that we're doing in packaging and procurement to reduce packaging and introduce more sustainable materials into the mix. So you'll see we have a range of different packaging types here as we transport food and non-food items um, for protracted emergencies, for rapid onset responses, and each of those comes with their own challenges and opportunities to incorporate new green criteria. Specifically for the non-food items, USAID has now put forth kind of a stock set list of preferred criterion, which we would like vendors to be able to meet. It's not required just yet, but we're moving in that direction as we keep tabs on what's possible and feasible with industry. So we're looking for packaging that's derived from sustainable or bio-based, more eco-friendly materials, um, switching out the cardboard boxes for unbleached cartons that are recyclable, removing unnecessary single-use plastic wrapping around items if it does not impact the condition and quality of the goods that are being shipped. Um, so here I won't read through this list, but I'm more than happy to to kind of send our emergency application guidelines and talk further about some of our thinking around how can we loosely begin to kind of push the envelope a little bit with some of our suppliers who are longstanding partners in our supply chain so that we can all kind of move together in this greener direction. One example to optimize and reduce packaging is we reconfigured pallets of plastic sheeting to remove the need for shrink wrap and to take away all those cardboard cartons. So now you'll see that the um, plastic sheeting is folded into individual sheets and just wrapped in more sheeting and then banded by um, eco-friendly, eco more durable straps. So those are kind of some of the shifts that we're looking to make. Um, we're also kind of keeping tabs on what industry is doing. So as you heard last webinar with Al Pinter, how they're looking to incorporate recyclable materials into their blankets. We have specialized nutritious food product suppliers looking to test out biodegradable or compostable options. Um, they found that this is incompatible with the needs to maintain shelf life and integrity of these, you know, RUSF or ready to use supplemental food, ready to use therapeutic food commodities. Um, but they're exploring different options and looking for ways to boost the recyclability of these otherwise pesky sachets. Similarly, on the shrink wrap side, um, we've been keeping our finger on the pulse for what industry is doing. And we tested a biodegradable shrink wrap option at the BHA warehouse in Miami. As the market continues to develop, we're hoping that more stronger durable material um, will come to light. We're kind of balancing the trade off of what's better having biodegradable material and having to do 10 more wraps to make sure it stays intact or to just stick with what we have and figure out how to manage it. So these are kind of some of the things that we're thinking about because we don't want to just have to rely on the country or program to have to manage waste. We're really looking to see how we can kind of do our part further upstream. Now that I've covered efforts to reduce, I'm going to cover the other two in the trifecta, redo, reuse and recycle. Um, so working to advance packaging life management, reuse and recycling really stems from this recognition of a few things. One, that we send a million plus packaging units into places that are often ill-equipped to handle an influx of materials. Two, that a significant amount of packaging is reused and repurposed. And um, finally, that this really truly should be part of our do no harm approach. Um, so we see here in this kind of in the upper left hand corner cartons that were improperly marked. 
um, packaging that can't be reconstituted. That kind of thing is something that we're also considering. So looking further up in the supply chain, not just at post distribution and in communities. Um, it's a fact that most packaging does ultimately break down or cease to have a use. So, for instance, the polypropylene bags can certainly be used to carry charcoal or other market goods. But when those break down, then they go on to another bag. How can we solidify some of those options for reuse? Um, recognize them so that we don't extract them from communities that need them but then also look to formalize or further fuel those efforts. Um, are there ways that we can help make fences or charcoal grills or flower pots even more durable? Are there ways that we can share these learnings with other programs so that they can also continue to keep, you know, their vegetable oil cans in circularity? Um, I'm really personally excited about the upcycling piece. I think there's a lot of cool examples of you know, products being turned into paving materials, construction materials, um, charcoal grills, what have you. So I really do want to continue to identify really interesting anecdotes and examples of entrepreneurs or companies who are looking to do this. So if you have information, please reach out anytime. I love to hear it all. Um, in cases where commodities are not upcycled, we'd like to resort to recycling. So we have um, been looking at opportunities to recycle, and because this differs from place to place, program to program, the joint initiative has been supporting a series of mappings to identify recycling capabilities proximate to every program. Um, all of these findings are publicly available attached to the country specific um, logistics cluster capacity assessments on the global logistics cluster website. I can link a few kind of later on in the presentation, um, but all of this is publicly available, done collaborative, collaboratively across all of the JI partners, as well as in coordination with local private sector and other local humanitarian partners. Um, I want to spread the wealth of knowledge. So the Antigua one, for instance, is interesting because it was done with the intention of understanding the unique capabilities across Caribbean island nations, not just in Antigua, um, and the recognition that many have invested in public-private partnerships to aid the collection, recycling, commercialization of waste, but these initiatives are still pretty small scale and not interconnected. So we worked with local and regional partners to begin to chip away at what opportunities to connect these waste streams exist, recognizing that many of these countries are in the face of recurrent natural disasters, um, see an influx of materials every year, and just finding ways to more proactively assess those landscapes rather than being in the throes of an emergency and then starting to look for options to recycle. Um, Collaboration is also really important on this one because we need to continually update these findings as the landscape changes. In the bottom left hand or in the bottom, what is that right hand corner? You'll see um, kind of some melted looking material, and that's actually flexible plastics. So we found, for instance, in Kenya, that there's an expanding flexible plastics market looking to recycle single use sachets, chip bags, RUSF sachets, what have you. So we're trying to kind of keep up to speed on what some of these different innovations are, what they're looking for, and how we can connect other um, you know, more tricky waste streams to these capacities. And we also need a more robust stock taking of the informal sector and entrepreneurial efforts to recycle and repurpose. You'll notice that that's missing from the global logistics cluster capacity assessment reports. It's certainly a very intricate, but important and foundational um, thing that we have to understand when we're looking to create these interventions. But um, just a disclaimer that we're the door is still open on all of these conversations. This brings me into one study that BHA specifically consigned. It's a private sector landscape assessment for Ethiopia and Kenya. And a PSLA is essentially designed to inform the extent to which the private sector is already supporting humanitarian assistance in a target region or sector. So for us, it was anything related to circular economy, 
in East Africa. Um, some of our interviewees extended beyond the confines of Ethiopia and Kenya to include places like Rwanda and Uganda, two places that have actually very robust waste management capacities already stood up. Um, we chose Ethiopia just because it's a site to some of our largest programs. They've received the most quote unquote packaging material in a given year, and they have few formal enterprises, but they do have strong informal economy. Um, so we were looking at that and then paired with Kenya, which has a burgeoning, robust kind of waste management sector. In Kenya, we actually learned that there's so many recycling companies in Nairobi that some are going out of business because they just are competing for such a finite pool of resources within Nairobi proper. Of course, there's so many other localities that could use their services throughout the country, but there are challenges to expanding operations, which I'll get into here as well. Um, this considered the range too. I should read actually read the slide here. Um, a range of private sector actors, and it's a mix of for-profit and public-private partnerships, as well as some nonprofits thrown in the mix. A majority of them are for-profit unassisted though. So here are some of the research questions that when we engage private sector, we ask. There's a little more nuance to this, and we've come to better hone our line of questioning, kind of that checklist for when you engage private sector, what are some of the inquiries that you should make to understand how best to partner with them? So also happy to talk through that with anyone anytime. We need to understand the market demand. Is it actually valuable for private sector to receive polypropylene, for instance? We know that steel has holds a lot of value, but what about some of the other plastics that we put into our supply chain? Um, what companies are working in where? Um, and yeah, these are just very general. We certainly have some more specific questions we can share. For sake of time, I'm just going to go through these. Um, so looking at markets. Markets is a big challenge for private sector to engage. Um, talking about commodity value, this impacts um, the international cost of oil, for instance, impacts the value of plastic. Taxation and regulation, there are many um, regulatory kind of constraints in countries like in Kenya, where companies are barred from transporting waste across district or county lines. Supply collection, labor, transportation, I think you can begin to understand what some of the challenges would be there. I just noticed the time, so I'm going to zoom through this. Um, so some of the recommendations that came out of this for BHA were to essentially look to institute waste management procedures for better sorting and tracking. So this is crucial for working with humanitarian organizations, investigate, investigate options to incorporate better collection and sorting, and then to um, essentially bring in end of life solutions and help fill gaps where where possible. So that brings us into this recycling concept that we co-developed with MIT's Lincoln Laboratory looking to address gaps in private sector reach while also acknowledging that it's impossible to store all of these materials in a neat condensed fashion. So a baler unit supports the densification, storage, transport, and handling of collected waste. You'll see kind of below this gentleman's right leg, it's a bale of 300 bags, while to his left, that's a pile of 100, just to give you a sense of how far this can support um, further storability and transportation. So uh, we considered a range of mobile to more permanent solutions. In Madagascar, it's going to be actually our first pilot program. We were first thinking about doing a mobile truck that could service different communities, but realized with the prevalence of secondary and improved roads that that just was not a smart idea. So we're opting for a more permanent solution attached to their development food security program. Essentially, CRS worked with three different youth groups that expressed on their own accord a desire to conduct waste management and wash activities. Um, so we conducted a private sector landscape assessment. CRS identified a mix of industrial recycling companies and upcycling startups alike. Um, small women owned companies looking to transform products into jewelry or bags. So looking to partner with a range of private sector. And currently, there's an ongoing community competition to collect materials, extract them from their communities, and over six tons have been collected to date since October. So that's pretty exciting. Now they've been receiving training on sorting techniques, and 
essentially going through this whole capacity building exercise. They've noted that they'd rather receive training and tools than financial incentivization. So we're just learning more about what is actually wanted when we engage these communities in terms of their own goals and their own kind of aspirations for how they see this playing out. That was really fast, but thank you for your interest and attention. Really looking forward to getting all of your insights on some of these topics. Um, but I think I now have to yield the rest of my time. So just thank you for your time. It was very well used time, Elise. Thank you so much. It was a very interesting presentation. Very much appreciated the pictures as well. And uh, just for everyone, the slides will be available later. Uh, and highly encourage you to take a look at that link in the chat on the private sector landscape assessment. It's very interesting. Um, we're now going to move to our second presentation and something I just want to flag um, from our earlier poll I saw in the chat. There's also a comment on apparent cost benefit of recycling as a challenge and externalizing the real long term costs of non recycling. So I just kind of want to flag that I think Elise started to hit on that and I'm sure Dr. Al Shafi will as well. Uh, but now we'll move on to Dr. Abdelatif Al Shafi for a perspective from development programming from his work on the USA recycling in Jordan activity. Over to you, Abdelatif. Uh, thank you, Liz, and thank you, everyone, for listening in. Um, uh, we're going to talk about our uh, experience at Schemonics uh, into making the local business for adapting circular economy. Um, we're excited to have been uh, working on the uh, uh, recycling uh, activity in Jordan. It's a five-year uh, program uh, funded by the USAID uh, for the um, towards uh, making recyclable more competitive in the uh, Jordan market. Oh, why am I not be able to? Okay. All right, um, starting off, um, uh, we're, I'm just gonna give you a quick background on the uh, waste situation in, uh, in Amman. Um, the program start, started in the last quarter of 2020. And at that time, um, um, there was about 3,200 uh, tons of waste being received daily in the, uh, in the landfill. And um, the estimates show that 5% of, uh, there's an annual increase of waste generation of about 5% on an annual basis and only 7% of uh, the, re the waste is being recycled in Amman. And as we are focusing on the commercial sector, um, here's a bit of a, a look on the landscape. There's about 99,000 establishments, uh, commercial waste generators in Amman, and those produce around uh, 682 tons per way of waste per day, and only around 89 of which is being recycled uh, per day, um, which gave um, the direction of the activity into increasing the commercial uh, recycling utilization, in increasing the commercial sector is, uh, utilization of recycling services in Amman. Okay. Um, as we said, uh, the uh, uh, the activity is a five-year activity, and we're just hitting the uh, third year of which. And we're gonna uh, we're now sharing some of the results, uh, the the activity results over the five years. Um, of course, these are not the uh, uh, most. They're not obviously the the full indicators, but we chose some of the key ones uh, that are relevant for the for today's presentation. Um, in terms of uh, waste the diversion from the landfill, we're trying to hit. Uh, 116 tons per day over the uh, 89 uh, tons that are diverted today from the landfill by the private sector. Also, we're trying to get to 2,500 establishments using the uh, recycling services from the private sector. And we are supporting the private sector service providers, 250 of which to improve uh, practices or technologies. Um, moving forward, uh, we're also looking to increase the uh, number of full-time equivalent jobs created through the program to 800 jobs. And uh, we'd like to give access to increased recyc recycling material for 1,800 informal waste pickers 
and uh, also on the uh, investment we're trying to uh, leverage five million dollars from the private sector investments throughout the activity um, as everyone knows we're uh, adapting a market system development approach whereby uh, the core of the service is actually the core of the uh, the system uh, relies on the uh, exchange of services between the supply and the demand and when we talk, talk about the supply is the supply of the services by the private sector and the demand is for the waste generators so we're all we're focusing on that relationship and uh, we're promoting the uh, utilization of the demand on uh, utilization and demand on the private on the uh, service recycling services and also expanding the services from the supply side um, we're also working on the enabling environment uh, being the uh, rules regulations and supporting functions um, some of which touch base with the standards the regulations the related services and the infrastructure our overall approach uh, in the market system development uh, relies on uh, strong partnerships with the private sector uh, being the service providers and the wage generators, the uh, NGOs, uh, the uh, community-based uh, organization and the, the civil society organizations. Also, as we're working on an enabling environment, we have to have uh, strong relationships and partnerships with the Ministry of Environment on the national level, on the national, on the national level, yeah, and uh, on a municipal level with the Greater Amman Municipality. Um, also, we're using the behavior uh, change communications as a pillar towards uh, addressing market failures, filling information gaps, and using it as a tool to facilitate the networking and communication and knowledge transfer. Um, by all means, we're also focusing on the gender, social, and uh, gender and social inclusion, especially in this sector. Uh, there's a lot of informality and um, um, like the informal waste pickers, and we found out that uh, that informality uh, require, includes a lot of uh, marginalized groups, uh, women and youth, and uh, we need to consider those uh, in the planning process. Um, at the early stage, we ran a quick market system analysis, uh, and I guess it's going to be shared in the uh, in the chat box, uh, whereby we try to um, prioritize or look on which uh, sectors we need to focus on, uh, what waste streams that would respond to the objectives of the projects. And uh, just at the beginning of the program, we've selected uh, four um, sectors to look at, being the uh, hotels, the shopping malls, the hypermarkets, and the restaurants and cafes. We thought that those are the most generating uh, sectors for the recyclable materials that we're interested in. And we've also prioritized waste streams in four uh, to begin with. Um, we focused on the plastics, on the paper and cardboards, on the metals and organics, uh, which actually um, dominate the dynamics of uh, the uh, recycling sector in Jordan as we started. Now we're two years down the road. Uh, we've expanded beyond these sectors and the material, but we're, uh, we're going to show you what we've done so far. Um, We've also, through the market system analysis, uh, defined the value chain, uh, starting from the waste generation point throughout the collection, the sorting, the aggregation, and uh, the processing, all the way to the local manufacturing or exporting. At the same time, we try to uh, define the root cause and the constraints facing the, uh, the recycling activities, the growth, the growth and expansion. And as you see on the screen, we've co color coded them and those constraints uh, show where they attribute towards which stage in the, um, in the uh, recycling value chain or uh, to what side of the supply versus demand and the enabling environment. Just to name a few, on the enabling environment, we've got uh, problems with the low implementation and the rules and export taxes. And on the supply side, the lack of technical knowledge and the lack of linkages were some of the constraints we're looking at, and the informal, uh, the informal uh, sectors integration and accessible accessibility to recyclables. With um, all these uh, analysis, we came to uh, design our interventions and strategic objectives into four pillars. The first one is improving and expanding the private sector 
um, recycling markets. Uh, this is a touching base with the supply side. And also the second one is increasing the demand and utilization of the recycling services in Amman. And this is on the um, uh, demand side. Transform uh, the informal waste workers and integrating them within the waste management. And finally is the uh, improving the business enabling environment for the recycling markets. We believe that those four strategic objectives feed into the overall uh, activity objective for increasing the commercial sector utilization of the recycling services. Um, with that, we'd like to shed some lights on the interventions for each of these pillars. On the uh, supply side, we've had to have uh, intensive partnerships with service providers to improve the profitability and expand waste management and recycling services. Um, that touches bases with the uh, performance and profitability and also with creating a model that could be expandable and could cater for the entrepreneurs and um, entrepreneurship uh, ideas. But for today's uh, session, we're just going to uh, highlight some of the interventions that actually fit into uh, increasing the profitability and uh, the performance of the sector. The first of which, and all of this is based on a result chain analysis that we believe having some of these interventions will actually get to the, uh, the overall uh, strategic objective for each of the pillars. So starting off with the small and growing business, we believe that the um, most of the service providers of the, uh, are of the uh, small and growing business uh, sizes, and they have limited capacities and they have the lack of business skills. For that purpose, we designed a small and growing business uh, training program that was designed to improve the market understanding, enhance the value proposition, and with these, they would be able to develop uh, effective service promotion and increase the performance and profitability. Uh, the training curricula, uh, of course, catered for the GC requirements and integrated them within the, uh, the training material. And to ensure sustainability for the delivery of the training program, we've partnered with local host organizations and uh, local training for the implementation uh, of the, uh, the training program. Till date, uh, 48 participants uh, engaged with the training program out of, uh, I would say, like uh, the uh, the starting pool for the service providers, the ones that were reported in the MSA report were around 200 uh, uh, institutions or, or uh, establishments. Um, witnessed improvements were actually found while uh, having a one-on-one -on -one coaching and uh, seeing the development of the uh, business growth plans by the people who went through uh, the program. Yet, um, with these sessions, we felt that there is a need for a firm level technical support that should focus on the um, areas or domains that are actually prohibiting the business growth, some of which is improving the supply chain, uh, the linkages, the partnerships, and uh, give them the chance to expand their services and capacity to handle more clients. And uh, with this uh, firm level technical support, we've established and um, ran a um, result-based incentive scheme. We developed it to encourage recycling, recyclers increase volumes and types, provided that they actually meet the requirements on the number of clients and volumes. There was a, a certain mechanism towards which you, uh, they integrate the, uh, the result-based incentive scheme. And we've actually leveraged uh, some uh, assistance through a special activity fund to offset the risk and to help establish and catalyze the infrastructure uh, expansion. Um, as linkages were, was one of the uh, constraints for the uh, expansion of the market, actually between the uh, service providers throughout the value chain and between the service providers and the waste generators. So uh, the activity developed the first recycling service directory, which will be shared through the, uh, the chat box. And um, the, we've developed and disseminated uh, uh, digital and printout uh, copies of the service directories. And it could be also used as material to uh, fill the gaps for um, 
market information and linkages between uh, the players. The, uh, the service directory included more than 100 entries for market actors, including marginalized groups, uh, youth and women. Um, now on the demand side, uh, there was a heavy engagement with the commercial sector to adapt the 3R uh, practices as uh, my colleague presented, being the uh, reuse, the, uh, the reduced reuse and recycling. And we focused on the commercial sector. Now, we believed also on, on uh, the results chain analysis that if the um, uh, waste generators compile or compose their waste management plans, it will actually um, require them to declare their waste and decide what they have, they're going to manage uh, their waste and make sure that they're linking with uh, specialized and licensed service providers. Nevertheless, and except, uh, although it was mandated under the, law, the waste management framework law, it was not clear enough to what extent a waste management plan is acceptable. And also there was no service delivery available in the market. So we thought we need to create a market system for that uh, uh, piece, like the waste management plans. So we worked heavily with the ministry to produce or to develop a policy tool as an instructions along with guides and templates on how to prepare the waste management plans. And also we, uh, in partnership with the uh, business associations, we delivered design and delivered awareness raising sessions on the new law, the requirements under the law and the promotion of the practices and also uh, an idea or uh, tools to uh, prepare the waste management plans. We've developed and disseminated a guidebook uh, and, in, and delivered interactive training programs with the business associations for the waste generators in terms of the best practices and the benefits for adapting recycling practices or the 3R principles, and also uh, hands-on experience on how to prepare the uh, waste management plans. And also we gave that hands-on training to waste to service providers so they can offer that services to uh, the waste generators. By these elements, we believe a market system for which is uh, paved the way for that. Um, an important piece since we're talking about a market system development is the value proposition between the uh, supply and demand uh, parties. So um, the activity worked intensively on uh, defining what could be a valuable uh, business model with testing of which uh, with different models and then the, the, um, the activity in partnership with um, leader service providers were able to offer integrated services and in partnership with um, influencing money, uh, wage generators who can um, finance and facilitate um, the um, integrated services uh, by the way the service provider we demonstrated or we facilitated um, uh, piloting three cases um, and the results show an increase actually in the amount of uh, sorted material and in the sales of the recycling so um, we're now moving into establishing the showcase and showcasing the pilot results to service providers and waste generators um, transmitting the uh, the benefits and actual uh, commercial sense of uh, having the services having the uh, transaction between the supply and demand on a commercial basis um, we learned that there's uh, no one model that fits all but we believe it's safe to say that integrate de delivering integrated services through a bundle set for services by the service provider being waste collection maybe separation at source um, waste management plans, waste composition, uh, a bundle will actually um, uh, give the commercial sense and the service providers could be able to improve and expand their services. Um, one interesting piece, as, as I said before, is uh, utilizing the awareness and behavior change communications towards filling the, uh, the gaps. Since the early uh, uh, stages of the, of the project, we've worked heavily with the stakeholders to understand the gaps and the misconception in the knowledge and information. And we try to fill that through our behavior change and awareness campaigns. We've conducted sector-based awareness raising sessions. We developed uh, and tested change management interventions. We worked with business leaders to disseminate gender sensitive information and uh, IC, IEC material. And we've actually in um, partnership with 
the ministry, uh, the Greater Amman municipality, and 20 ser uh, service, uh, I mean, uh, private sector uh, entities and um, uh, business associations. We've launched a behavior change campaign that lasted over a month, and uh, the results were very interesting. There, we saw insights on social media posts around 2.5 uh, million uh, hits, and the um, the count on the hashtags and the uh, uh, other uh, channels on the World Wide Web reached up around 5.6 uh, million uh, hits a reach. Um, getting towards the end of my time, so I'm going to just uh, zoom in through the rest of the slides. Uh, the third strategic objective is to uh, transform the informal sector. The market system analysis also showed us that there is a, a lot of informalities in the market, but this informal activities actually count for most of the 7% of the recycling uh, rates. Um, however, uh, the informals were using uh, harmful, uh, non-environmentally uh, or sound um, techniques, and it was kind of uh, non-hygienic. So there was a, a need for a process to transform the informal sector into for more formal activities. And that was this divided into two tracks, um, a capacity building for the informal sector through uh, waste picker trainings and certification program that included eight modules ranging from technical capacities into soft skills and um, business skills, and also took into consideration the, the GC um, uh, requirements. And partnerships with local organizations, we were able to uh, conduct um, and coach the delivery of 18 uh, cohorts. And till now, there's 400 trainees who actually, including 45 females, participated in the training. The lovely part is that the surveys showed improvement in the livelihoods. There are 77% of which they said they had a better income. 83% uh, said that they have better access to uh, recyclables and better reach to waste generators. At the same time, we were trying to find a better model to have them integrated within the system. So we started with uh, looking at the legal and formal approach, which was not ready at the moment. Uh, so we uh, opted out to a municipal recognition through partnership with Greater Amman Municipality on a basis of a temporary work network that actually recognizes uh, the activity of the informal sector. And we're at the moment trying to find a way to uh, form have that activity uh, integrated within the formal uh, value chain. We have in mind uh, several ones we're going to uh, explore during the next year, one of which is the recycling banks concept, which we're going to be talking about in a in few minutes, and also uh, the newly adapted principle in Jordan, which is the extended producer responsibility. We don't know the how yet, but we're, uh, we're, up, we're hoping that uh, We'll have more than uh, one integration model for these people uh, to uh, to get through the the value chain. Uh, this is one of the pictures actually from the uh, training session uh, showing the trainers, the trainees, and the representative from the municipality towards the uh, certification day. Our last piece uh, on the uh, uh, interventions is the uh, enabling environment. Enhancing the enabling environment, we believe will ease out the transaction and uh, the uh, enable the growth of uh, the uh, the sector increasing the demand on the service on the services and uh, expansion for the service providers um, also um, in, under the enabling environment we worked heavily with the uh, ministry of environment on strengthening the national regulatory policy the the um, the waste management framework law was out, but the, the needed instruments to make it more practicable and uh, applicable to the uh, to the waste generators or to the um, uh, yeah to the waste generators and service providers was not clear. So we worked with them to fill that gap. We also supported GAM in with the engagement uh, in the private sector recyclers and waste generators, and we continued working with other donors and development agencies in, on the circular economy just to uh, align the uh, and streamline the interests. On the advocacy side, we're um, promoting the domestic recycling sector through tax and trade incentives, and for that we are facilitating a dialogue a continuous dialogue between uh, the private sector and the official authorities. We started by uh, nominating who's uh, best to represent uh, the, uh, the 
the private sector's interest, and we're um, juggling between uh, the uh, the issues uh, that uh, that they need to be presented to the government, and we're trying to also organize in the next year a roundtable discussion to address those challenges. And we might be uh, actually we're going to be hosting a, a con recycling conference that uh, will host a, a panel discussion between uh, the recyclers, the waste generators, and the government to discuss some of these issues. Um, my last uh, piece on the enabling environment, actually uh, introducing the recycling concept that actually summarized uh, all that what we did, discussed earlier. It's a new uh, innovative scheme that we are uh, pitching for to be part of the municipal system uh, waste management system. The concept promotes separation at source, and it works actually as a bank, like a drop off, drop off point for recyclables in, in exchange for money. And uh, so um, citizens, waste generators, and informal sector can bring in uh, their sorted recyclables to the facility in exchange for money. Uh, the facility will be operated by a private sector. So this is the engagement of the private sector. And it's a joint initiative with the municipality as uh, to promote it as part of the, uh, the system. We're actually in the process of piloting to, uh, the, the concept in two pilot locations in Amman in uh, partnerships with GAM. Uh, my last slide on uh, touches based on the reflections of the work we've done over the last two years. And uh, some of the points that are interesting to keep in mind is that partnerships with business associations were found to be fundamental to establish the reach and impact on a sector level because the project is not oriented to be a uh, one on one. It, we would like to have impact on a sector level. So uh, partnerships were very crucial for that. Service providers, uh, they have different uh, modules and business models to deliver their services. So there's no um, one size fit all uh, approach. And uh, um, there was a bit of a, a challenge to finding out what business models could work and what not. And we're still growing with these ones to, to cater for the available uh, service delivery modules in, on the market. Um, municipal recognition schemes were found to be more acceptable and easily done to integrate the uh, the waste pickers rather than the formal system, which has been um, the the, cover, the the country was trying to uh, to achieve on the, over the last five years, so we were able to break through that barrier. Uh, legislative process unfortunately takes time and involves multiple stakeholders, which affects the practical implementation on the ground, and also the uh, law enforcement has not encouraged the private sector engagement in the waste management. So the focus was on creating the uh, the commercial sense and establishing the one-on-one -on -one relation between the si supply and demand side. Sorry if I take more than, took more than my time. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. I give it back to you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, Abdel Latif. It was a, a very interesting presentation and so wonderful to see. You all have a lot of activities going on, but it was, it was very helpful to see the holistic view as well, working in all the channels. Um, I think we, so we're going to move into our Q&A session now. We have some moderated questions, but actually there's quite a number of questions that have come up in the chat. Uh, so I think we'll actually flip it and start with those just to make sure we get through them. So let me just pull those up. And then if we have time, we can hit on the others. So it looks like the first question, and I believe at least this may have come up um, dear, during your presentation, so we can start with you and Dr. Abdelatif if there's anything you'd like to add. Um, and just to know, uh, feel free, um, if any of your colleagues would like to join with supporting remarks, I'm happy to have those as well. The first question is, is there a repository of successful, adopted, or scaled upcycling ideas? Um, this person loves the example of the planting containers made from metal containers. So maybe Elise? Whoever asked, I'd love to collaborate with you on one. I have kind of an Excel file where I've been capturing names of companies, you know, from uh, Kenya to Colombia to everywhere in between, and would love to continue to expand that list and um, just further that stock taking exercise. So maybe it can be a collaborative effort, but I certainly have an Excel file that can be shared with others. No formal activity has been done, though, on this, so at least not yet. I love how open you are to collaborating. We, maybe we include that in our links as well. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. Um, great. Well, moving to the next one then. Um, 
Of the four categories of waste, and I believe, Abdelatif, this may have come up when you were talking about uh, commercial waste generation, uh, which have been proven to be have the most potential for recycling reuse? Are any of them especially problematic? Well, this is an interesting question. Um, actually, it's always the uh, the market and the uh, the regional global uh, challenges dictate what what is being collected and what is being dealt with. Um, at, at the moment, um, a lot of effort is put into the plastics and the paper and cardboard. The challenge is with the um, um, conditions or the prices of water and the, the scarcity of water and the prices of the power. It's not always easy to have recycling facilities and in markets within the country. So most of these transactions end up being exported uh, out of the country. But plastic, I think there's a lot of potential into it. And um, there's a lot of activities being uh, happening because the, the byproduct or the end product of which is not limited. So I think plastics, paper and cardboard uh, have a great potential uh, for recycling. And I know at least you kind of hit on this as well. Is there anything that the, the BHA or joint initiative is looking at um, differently or more in line in the same lines of what Abdel Latif is mentioning? Nothing specifically yet. I think we're trying to rely on insights um, such as his to further kind of inform our direction. So it's all super interesting. Um, great. Well, and I think a, a lot of these came up during um, maybe related to Jordan, but again, Elise um, or Laura, if there's anything from the, the more general BHA perspective, please feel free to include as well. But the next question is, what is the profile of the firms that were supported, uh, meaning size, capacity of recycling, and what were their incentives to recycle? Who paid for their recycling service? So I think of Delatif, um, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. This is also an, this is another interesting question. Uh, most of the recyclers uh, in the private sector are small and growing business sizes. So um, um, only few of them uh, were actually uh, proper businesses in terms of size, but still the, uh, the offering is, is limited. And um, the incentive was um, getting more material because the problem is with the supply chain. So uh, the uh, the idea is to have the waste generators separate their waste at source and have the accessibility of the service providers to collect that so the uh, recyclable material. And uh, the way it was done before, none of these practices or limited practices were on the uh, separation at source. So uh, service providers were not so uh, uh, productive in terms of uh, collecting the um, mixed waste and transferring them to the landfill and picking whatever they can from the recyclable materials. But with the uh, introduction of the waste management planning, declaring the types of waste and having the separation at source, that was the incentive for the recyclers to include or the waste management operators because some of them converted from not being recyclers into recyclers because the availability of the quality and volume of recyclables are being sorted at source and that was their incentive to pitch for integrated services and make a commercial sense for the uh, waste generators and the recyclers to deal with the recyclable material. Thank you. And I think that really hits too at that, you know, the core of the market systems approach you were talking about with hitting at root constraints. So now that's really helpful to know. Um, Elise, this one's a bit more general, so maybe coming over to you. Uh, as most of the consumers in your host countries have limited income, will your innovations increase the cost of consumer products, including food? Um, will this reduce the affordability of food and reduce food security? It's a really great question, and I'm sure that that would be more in line with some of our local, regional, international procurements. Laura Meissner, our TPQ markets lead, might have a better answer for this. Um, but what we've been covering kind of on our side is the U.S. in kind Title II piece and non-food items that we dispatch for emergencies. So we haven't really gotten into that level of analysis or understanding of what impacts 
could have on markets. Um, certainly something that we want to be cognizant of, though. Laura, over to you. Yeah, honestly, I think uh, in a sense that would be a good problem to have. Not that we want the price of food to increase clearly, but I don't think we are at the scale yet where we would be seeing this at all. And often keep in mind, right, a lot of what Elise was talking about is coming from the perspective of BHA as a major purchaser of these items. And so, you know, how can we um, buy things that are going to be better for the environment, have specifications that affect things? The cost of those items is really not passed on, right? We're talking about food and non-food assistance, um, emergency nutrition support. These are not things that people in the recipient countries pay for. This is stuff that's given out as humanitarian aid and then the packaging, whether it is left in country for upcycling and reuse or what have you that you know there's not a price given on that at its point of entry it's included as part of the assistance if there ends up being a secondary market that would be an additional thing for it but uh honestly i do not see the scope or the linkages into food supply chains having an effect on food prices um happily And thank you both uh, for response and sorry to be kind of skipping around. I think um, some of these are, are very specific in general. So thank you. Uh, I think as your, uh, we change perspective between both. Um, but coming back over to you, uh, Dr. Al Shafi, can you speak to the tax side of the uh, market systems development? Were there any tax credits uh, for actors in the system? How much and what were the aggregate gains or subsidies given? Oh, actually this, uh, we. Well, what we've done so far is highlighting where the uh, root causes is and the uh, areas of improvement with key recommendations. Um, we're trying with the uh, engagement of the private sector to put pressure on the uh, government to make some changes on the same. Nothing has happened yet because we were still in the um, planning phase and uh, finding the, uh, the best um, spokesman on behalf of the private sector to make those challenges and to lobby against them. But uh, some of the areas were actually um, uh, having a, a level plan, a level field for the uh, uh, recyclers, uh, because now today, I think there is a different treatment between the waste streams and the, the types of waste. Um, some of the areas of improvement could be introducing tax cuts or tax reductions and or, and or exemptions on the uh, activities concerning the, um, the recycling, the recycling uh, uh, industry, whether it's on the income tax, the sales tax, the input material, or even the machineries that could be used within the recycling. And we're proposing also some uh, uh, tax reduction, the reductions or incentives for research and development just to promote uh, the whole sector. Um, also, uh, things we're uh, we're working as uh, we're working with is providing incentives. Actually, um, uh, not only um, uh, the, uh, the taxation, but um, uh, um, incentives for people who actually use recycling input into their um, uh, production processes to uh, promote. Uh, the circularity, and maybe we can um, have impact on the prices uh, within the local market compared to imports. Some of these ideas are still um, being considered, but this, the first ones to work with taxes is to uh, uh, have a proper mechanism to uh, promote the recycling, uh, we're dealing with the GST, the uh, schedules, and having a level field for uh, people working with different types of uh, recycling material. Thank you. No, that's wonderful. And I think it's also, you kind of hit a little bit on the next question that we got as well, which was, seems uh, since it seems it's challenging to recycle waste, it seems more desirable to avoid or minimize it. Um, are you working on policy strategies or tax or regulations um, to ban the generation of waste? So it sounds like Dr. Abdelatif, um, 
more on the incentive schemes and kind of exploring other options. I don't know, Elise uh, or Laura, if there's anything from the, the BHA joint initiative perspective you'd like to share on this, or it may not be an area you all are looking into as much. Yeah, that's not as much an area for BHA. Um, Erica, sorry, I don't know if she's still on, um, but Erica, if you want to talk about how, um, what BHA's contribution to environmental goals are, if you're able to unmute yourself. Okay, many thanks for that, Laura. Sorry, I am. Uh, a little bit of a delay in unmuting myself. Um, so, um, with apologies, if if the question could be could be reframed. Um. Sure. Yeah. Um, so to to repeat it, since it seems challenging to recycle waste, it seems more desirable to avoid or minimize it. Are you working on any policy strategies um, to tax or regulate slash ban the generation of waste? So I think um, a, a good a good way to look at this in a very big picture manner, and, and again, um, I'm Erica Colseri. I'm an environmental officer with uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance and with other BHA colleagues uh, deeply involved in the development of the USAID climate strategy. So I think it, it is really exciting to see the level of attention, not only during the climate strategy development, but even beforehand with the agency and global emphasis, including in the US Congress, on reducing marine plastics, uh, for example. And so this work that we have been doing for many years now in the joint initiative has also been engaging with um, <clears throat> some of our development partners looking um, in those types of spaces as well. And as I included a chat earlier in this uh, discussion, it is quite um, critical to note that under our climate strategy, you know, looking at issues of plastics not only in our programs, but also again um, as, as as our own footprint as organizations, um, including our supply chain. Right, that's part of our footprint. You know, we have a massive uh, supply chain um, as as the work that we're talking about here, and also thinking about Global Health Bureau. So. That special objective uh, that I noted early on, and I included a link on the climate links website for people to learn a little bit more about that. That really is um, putting that kind of policy level attention on really thinking hard about how we can reduce our own plastics and again. We don't reduce them as the US government. We reduce them in concert with our private industry uh, producers, uh, distributors, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I think we do have a good example. Um, Elise, forgive me, I don't know if you mentioned, um, I want to say it's next week, uh, the joint initiative is hosting uh, a session with Shelterbox, um, talking about how Shelterbox has removed a lot of plastics, for example, in the shelter package uh, kits for humanitarian assistance. So I think more broadly, um, there has been a big upswing into being much more proactive about thinking about environmental sustainability um, in these types of manners. And as Elise even noted early on in her presentation, we are um, you know, working side by side with other donors, with other multilateral organizations in terms of changing procurement uh, standards. We don't have any clear, hard and fast, as Elise noted, but those are the types of things and we're seeing tremendous excitement and innovation coming out of the private industry as well. And again, we had a joint initiative um, special uh, a webinar, um, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago before uh, Thanksgiving. Sorry, the, the, the climate change meeting has made things a bit of a blur in terms of timing that the, the COP27 meeting in Egypt. But, um, but you know, we, we saw innovation in terms of, you know, using seaweed, you know, algal based uh, plastics and how that can make some really significant, significant shifts and sort of bringing those types of approaches to to scale. Um, so there's a lot of interest in innovation and I've been working with USAID for, um, I guess, about 18 years now. And frankly, this is uh, the, the, the biggest attention that I have seen um, towards these types of, um, you know, focus on plastics and focus on on really seeing ways that we can be more effective and efficient um, in our humanitarian assistance, uh, certainly. Thank you. 
No, that's wonderful. Thank you, Erica. And I think you, you really underscored the importance of the enabling environment piece as well when we're looking at the, the systems approach. So no, thank you. Um, Abdullah, if I see if your hand, you have your hand raised, would you like to add something? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I like the question, so I wanted to chip in with some of the things that we're doing. Um, uh, we're actually using the enabling environment and the regulatory piece to push people towards using the services of the private sector and to push waste generators towards having um, their waste separated at source and dealing with licensed and authorized uh, waste um, uh, service providers, recycling service providers. But also we're using these mechanisms as, um, um, or these pieces as mechanisms to um, direct people towards reducing actually the uh, the waste because under the uh, uh, polluter pay principle we're um, moving into uh, the uh, the mechanisms for the fee schedule to uh, against uh, providing the serv the waste management services by the uh, the municipalities uh, to be um, uh, as an um, a reversed mechanism for people to avoid uh, um, producing waste generating waste or uh, moving towards uh, the separation at source and recycling. And on the banning uh, issue, I think we're, we're gonna start discussing with the ministry, the uh, banning of, or the reduction on the single use uh, plastic bags and uh, getting maybe some um, uh, regulations or instructions out of the door, uh, the door to, uh, to deal with that piece as well. So I think uh, the, um, the dealing with the uh, regulations could be a strong piece actually to uh, towards with changing behavior for the waste generation. Yes, thank you. It's wonderful. Some very interesting activities. Thank you. Um, there's a couple questions I think getting around some of the the work with the informal sector, some of the work kind of when we're talking about a just transition. So I might group a few together. Um, but maybe just a quick first one um, for Abdelatif. Uh, are the waste pickers compensated uh, from public or private entities at all? Just kind of a quick one. Um, direct compensation is only by the sale and the transaction for the sale of recyclables that they get their hands on. So uh, informal sector today with their not very regulated practices. They reach out to recyclable materials, which is not in great volumes and not in good shape. But this is what they can get without our intervention to have them recognized and access the increase their accessibility to material. And then they manage to sell those recyclables to middlemen and aggregators along the way. And this is how they're compensated. By no means they're compensated or accepted even uh, by the uh, the public practice, but. Um, because they don't have any solutions for them, the actual law for banning these activities is not fully in triggered. So um, this is how they get compensated at the moment. Great. Thank you. And kind of taking that a, a little bit further, one person had a question. Uh, what could you tell us about the work policies in the collection centers that include the exclusion of uh, child labor, forms of payment, among others? Uh, so maybe, yeah, if there's anything specific to that, or maybe more in general, just some of your work um, when you're looking at those policies in the informal sector. Oh, I might have missed that question. Can you repeat it? Please? No, of course. Um, what could you tell us about the work policies in the collection centers that include the exclusion of child labor, forms of payment, among others? Well, what we're trying to do today for the uh, informal sector is for the recognition piece. And as we said, we've developed uh, a municipal approach whereby they recognize the uh, trained certified waste pickers that they have to comply with prerequisites and what have you. And part of these regulations is uh, to commit to the labor law uh, the age, uh, the abuse of uh, childhood and what have you. So this is the mechanism we have so far. And uh, we we may have to ask the operator for the recycling centers to adapt some of these uh, uh, policies to eliminate or reduce or like deal with uh, that issue as well. 
uh, once we integrate the recycle the informal activities with those recycling banks we're still in the design phase so uh, once we get the implementation this is a good point to take into consideration as well um, and one more question kind of on the, the same vein, and then I think we can we can switch to a different theme. Uh, given the relatively high cost of manual labor in Jordan to improve productivity on the formal sector side, have you considered introducing or incentivizing labor saving recycling sorting technologies? Well, at the moment, there is no national scale uh, facilities for recycling. So what happens today, there, there used to be one, but uh, the, it was not operated properly and it went out of business. So what we're trying to do today is on, on two parts. One is to um, minimize the need for downstream uh, sorting by having it separated at source and a proper separate collection. So we don't have, we don't have the need for dirty uh, MRFs. We move to a clean MRFs that needs, uh, requires less uh, operations for the uh, recycled or semi-recycled, semi-separated material. Um, the government, and, and we're trying to push for the recycle, the private sector to do most of the job between the uh, the waste generators, separation at source, and the specialized uh, recyclers who might be uh, interested to take uh, multiple waste streams or specialized waste streams. At the moment, also, we're uh, in discussion with the municipality who actually understands the need to move into uh, privatizing or having a private sector running the, the operations. So the, the municipality is thinking of establishing a public owned. Uh, they actually have established it, but we're, we're helping them in um, uh, designing the strategic vision and what activities need to be done. Um, and that should cover the upstream and downstream activities. The upstream ones are the separation, the collection, and the transportation. But downstream, what you need to do with these uh, um, recyclables, and uh, part of which is we're promoting for a clean MRF, where you need, where you don't need to have uh, intensive operations and labor. But once we get to that point, we'll see how how automation can support uh, minimizing the cost for the same. Thank you. No, I think that's a, a very interesting blend of kind of technology as we as we look at climate change. So uh, the next question I'm going to direct at Elise, but also if there's anything you'd like to say, um, if the BHA is looking at anything with uh, labor saving technologies for recycling, please feel free to include. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but the next question is, have you looked at using hard plastic containers that are expensive but reusable and how they can be moved back down the supply chain to be reused? Uh, this person has seen this with tomatoes in Nepal and wholesale market in Bangkok. Definitely we've considered it. We haven't directly tested anything, but um, for instance, for the vegetable oil tin cans, we know that that's not often the most appropriate means to distribute the commodity vis-a-vis -vis the ration size. So often they'll get cut and poured into another container. So thinking how can we take out the steel cans in this whole equation if that's not even what's ultimately being used to distribute the commodity. We worked with the World Food Program to do a bulk vegetable oil pilot, actually. Um, that's still kind of in the works, but can be sure to let you know what lessons learned or insights come from that. So we're looking to send bulk oil in a tanker vessel and the World Food Program has a food ATM concept um, that we're aware of, we have not directly engaged with, but that essentially gets to the whole notion of shipping in bulk, having some sort of dispensary, and then inviting program participants to come and take their allotted amount or whatever portion of their allotted amount they desire. So we're definitely looking at options to ship in bulk or to transport materials in larger containers. Um, there's, of course, like logistics and handling trade offs, which we also have to be considerate of and just food safety quality issues on the food side. So it takes a lot of time, research and development and testing to really understand what works, what's appropriate and what can be done. So that's a great question. And I think it's a, a great plug too for the joint initiatives newsletter. Um, I believe we dropped the link, but if not, it'll be shared after and also encourage you to sign up there to stay tuned. 
Um, I know mean, we're getting towards the end, so maybe just uh, one or two more questions, and then I think we'll we'll end it with one question uh, for both our panelists. Uh, so let's just see. There's one question um, mentioning uh, you seem to put a lot of reliance on government innovations. Uh, do the host governments have the tax basis to fund these proposed government costs? And I know, um, Abdelati, if you all look at different ways of financing, like how you're financing these models. So maybe um, to the, the first question, do the host, does your host government have the tax basis to fund these proposed costs? And also, are there different time, types of financing you all are looking at for these models? Um, very challenging question, but uh, I believe Till today, the government has been working on a linear economy basis, collecting, transporting, and dumping the uh, the uh, the waste with the recyclable materials. Unfortunately, so today, if we're moving into a green uh, circular economy and um, uh, introducing those new principles of the separation at source, the separate collection, and dealing with the recyclables, we all understand there's going to be um, investment into the infrastructure and a behavior change between the uh, service providers, the wage generators, and even or and or the government who's going to be uh, running that uh, operations. But we also believe that there is revenue from the recyclers and there is end markets that will be um, looking towards uh, capturing those recyclable materials, whether to put it into uh, local manufacturing or um, dispatching out of the country as an export. The government today uh, supply the majority of the waste management services, even the traditional one, uh, through the municipalities. And this is a service provided by the government, so they're providing it on a non-profit basis. Having said that, there's a lot of um, deficit in the current uh, system. So we believe that introducing new pieces that actually capture the recyclables um, put some uh, upscaling or reuse or introducing those material into the circular economy, um, reducing the reliance on virgin material or important uh, imported inputs for the uh, the markets will actually save a lot of the costs dealing with the collection transportation and the the manufacturing part, and also increasing the um, um, build or the pre-treated material uh, to neighboring countries will expand the export if we manage also to put some tax incentives on the exporting. So we'll be shifting from spending a lot of costs to deal with a linear economy to adding a bit more uh, capital cost and maybe some operational cost, but we're gaining a lot of uh, cost reductions and some revenues from the same. And also shifting from um, not super, um, uh, let me say, uh, the utmost uh, uh, optimum performance from the public sector into more uh, private sector business mind into waste management delivery and recycling will also reduce costs and cut corners into the spending. So a bundle of these will enhance the financial proposition of waste management across the city. And um, I believe we're still going to be in, uh, in deficit for the first, I don't know how many years, but if we if we do it properly and if we try to find the best utilization of the waste, introducing the uh, uh, complementary technologies to get more uh, benefit from the recyclable material or the energy uh, that could be extracted out of the same and reducing the cost of having to deal with the uh, existing landfills or the closure of the landfills and the monitoring and whatever you have to do for the life cycle after the closure. All these put together will put our financial or fiscal problems in a much better situation. Then we'll find out how much deficit we still have to deal with or if we can tip the scale into a profitable business. Thank you. Yes, I see the, the fingers crossed. Yes, definitely have to give it time, but thank you. Um, so we're, we're kind of wrapping up. I saw there was one question on hotels. Uh, recommend please take a look at the market analysis, uh, the Jordan recycling activities, latest annual reports are also online and feel free to connect with Dr. Al Shafi. Um, but just to wrap this up, maybe one quick last comment from both speakers. Um, yeah, a short response on 
what you found has been the most impactful strategy for making the business case to private sector actors to adapt their waste management practices? And again, just a, a short kind of last response. Maybe at least start with you. Really, the biggest business case is that reaching some of our mo more remote programs is worthwhile for their bottom line. So that's why we're looking to incorporate some of these technologies or program shifts so that we can aggregate enough to demonstrate value. I think another piece of this too is using kind of the humanitarian um, place that we sit, recognizing that there are all of these alliances and partnerships uh, like Trademark East Africa, for instance, that looks to reduce barriers to trade. How can we advocate through some of those existing forums to support private sector objectives and break down barriers to trade and um, remove some of those restrictive regulations? So I think there's a lot that we can do kind of with programs, but then also kind of through advocacy and policy channels. Um, that's a high level answer to a loaded question. Absolutely. And Dr. Ashafi? Yeah, just quickly, um, yeah, and it, uh, dealing with the actual trades of the market system development and learning the barriers and what is stopping or hindering the system from running by its own and um, uh, capitalizing on the uh, uh, regulatory and uh, law pieces. And from our experience, we actually found out that the environmental um, uh, motivations is not enough. Uh, the law and the enforcement will not get most of the people to do what they need to do. So the what, what is successful in making the business case is to find out a win-win situation and transaction that is actually beneficial to both the supply and demand. And this is this has been proven by practice that this is the core of the market system and this is what Jordan needs. Uh, most of the people are still reliant on the services that's being uh, so the majority of it subsidized and delivered by the public system. But today with the implementation of the new law system, uh, the, uh, the waste generators have to start believing that they're part of the solution. They still have to pay for the, uh, um, the proper service delivery, uh, the uh, integration of the um, uh, extended producer responsibility. Like everyone knows that they should be part of making that system happens. So we're preparing people that if it's coming by the law, you might as well uh, take a, a few steps ahead and start um, uh, preparing yourself with the waste management plans, understanding the value of the, the, the waste that you have uh, within your facility, um, uh, how you can reduce the costs, how you can make profits if you're dealing with the private sector. So integrating an economy sense and a commercial business deal between the supply and demand, this is what has been uh, uh, successful so far even on the service provider side, because everybody was on a stereotyping, um, uh, thinking that uh, it's more costly to uh, to deal with recyclables than just to take a mixed waste and transport it to, uh, to the landfill. And everybody is um, so attached to their existing business models. So in, in inducing the new thinking of a commercial sense will, while dealing with recyclables that are separated at source with better volumes and qualities and make the business sense of it, I think this is the trigger that we're working on. And I think that that was a perfect way to sum up the, the webinar and the very interesting presentations you both have given us. So thank you both so much for taking the time to speak with us and share the important work that your programs are doing, as well as your diverse uh, perspectives on how we can all work together. Uh, to advance the circular economy of practices in a sustainable and inclusive way. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Julian Market Links to close this out. Thank you so much, Liz. And thank you to all of our wonderful speakers today uh, for such interesting and engaging presentations and dialogue. Um, we want to thank all of you for joining us again. And just a reminder that today's webinar has been recorded and the recording will be shared on market links as well as the slide deck, as well as a list of many of the great resources that were that was shared today. Um, so thank you again and hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, to exit today's meeting, just click on the red X at the lower um, navigation bar on your screen. Thank you.